So, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming so early to this very short talk. 15 minutes goes by very quickly, so I'm just going to start. And first of all, an enormous thank you to Simona, Luca, Daniela, and the team for their very smooth organization and the kind invitation to participate in Arc Marathon. It's my first experience of this unique award, and it's been an incredible one. And it's very rare to get the opportunity to socialize and swap ideas with colleagues from around the world. And this really has been an international jury, so thank you. I'm also very aware that it's nine o'clock on a Saturday morning, and probably many of you have a little bit of a headache from last night. And I'm going to talk about a slightly different form of architectural practice, one that relates very strongly to my context, to my continent, Africa. So we are the world's youngest continent with an average age of 19.8 years compared to Europe, which has an average age of 39, and the United States, which has an average age of 41. So from my perspective, education is both the battleground and the playground of the future. So I'm gonna begin this short presentation with, with a video, which I hope will set the stage or the scene for my talk. Can I play? Accept this, we'll start our own movement. <laughs> Students must fall. Again, we'll continue to monitor the situation. 
location here on SABC News will bring you the latest uh, throughout the day there, Devon. Uh, certainly, uh, students seem to be quite furious over the latest event that's about to be studio. So I just want to say that two of my students were involved in the making of this film. So I'm currently the head of the Graduate School of Architecture at the University of Johannesburg, which is now Africa's largest postgraduate school of architecture, as well as its newest. And I'm aware that there are a couple of uh, projects in this, year this year's lineup from Africa, but in general, as a continent, we score very low on competition entries for a whole range of reasons that I won't go into here. But what I'd like to do today is to focus on something else, which is my own practice, and to say up front that I no longer build buildings, I build curricula and teachers and students and programs. Directing the school is now my practice, and it has taken me a number of years to be both comfortable and openly ambitious about it. It's an interesting time to be the head of an African school, and probably nowhere more interesting than in South Africa. I don't know how much of it made the headlines elsewhere in the world, but in South Africa, in tertiary education, 2015, 2016, and 2017 were dominated by the student protests, which have ushered in some dramatic changes, even if we're not quite sure how to handle them. The film I showed was taken in 2015 at the height of the protests, which shut down many of the country's universities. The protests were directed first at a statue of Cecil John Rhodes at the University of Cape Town, which is South Africa's premier university. The protests quickly became violent, as you saw in the film, and the campuses around the country were closed down by a combination of the army and the police. Partly because of the very heavy-handed reaction by the authorities, there was no space to really discuss or to talk openly about the issues that surfaced, so they went underground for a few months and then erupted in the second protest movement, Fees Must Fall, which combined the anger at the very sl slow pace of racial and economic transformation of the universities with the issue of access for poor black students who justifiably feel left out of Mandela's rainbow nation. I think it's hard for anyone who hasn't either been to South Africa or lived there for any length of time to understand just how racially divided the country still is 24 years after democracy. I often say that South Africa is a two-generation project, 40 years if not more, but it's not a particularly popular position. And I'm also aware that I live in South Africa as an outsider, I'm not from there, so I have the foreigner's blindness, but also the foreigner's insight, which is a particularly privileged position to hold. But you may ask yourself, what does this have to do with architecture? Well, everything and nothing. South Africa is currently, and it will be for some time to come, the most unequal society on the planet. In 2018, a World Bank report listed South Africa's equality index at 63 over 100, with zero representing the most equal. Much of Africa sits somewhere between 58 and 67, but the issue is more pressing and more potentially dangerous in South Africa, since the gulf between rich and poor is also a racial gulf, which makes it both easy to see and almost impossible to cross. One of the most overlooked and under-talked about issues when we talk about equality, particularly in education, is about the equality of the imagination. For many years, South African students have been confined to a diet of two distinct 
and different paradigms. On the one hand, luxury residential and commercial projects built for the tiny white majority. And to give you some context, 95% of the country's land is owned by 5% of the population. And for much of its urban history, South African cities have been spatially segregated into three distinct areas. A business district where blacks and whites work during together, together during the day, the suburbs where white people live, and the township where blacks were, seg were sent after the end of the working day. 24 years after democracy, that has not changed much. But the other architectural paradigm has been the poverty paradigm, where projects designed to uplift the black population have been traditionally conceived by white students who march into the townships, try to intervene in what are often impossible situations, and retreat, confused and guilty, at the end of the day to their suburbs. Now this was more or less the situation I inherited when I took over the master's program in 2015. There were 11 students in the program, all white, and the curriculum I inherited was something that Britain threw out in 1971. So we decided to change it. We brought in a teaching program from the AA and the Bartlett, which we have named Unit System Africa. And in our first year, we've gone from 11 students to 52. This year, we are 115 students, with 163 accepted for February next year, which is the beginning of our academic year. So we are the biggest postgraduate school in Africa. You can follow us on Instagram, happening at the GSA or Unit System Africa, or go to the school's website, www.gsa.ac.za, to see what we're up to. But we began with a very simple idea that African students are like students everywhere else. We intend to make the same opportunities for innovation, imagination, and intuition available for African students of architecture as for anyone. And that combination of anger, youthful ambition, and a specific, very brutal history has gifted South Africa with a unique set of circumstances that are intimately connected to architecture and the shaping of the landscape, the built environment, and the future. And if there was ever a context in which architecture genuinely has the power to change the world, this is it. The very first slide of this presentation was entitled Guest from the Future, and it's a line taken from the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova's poem, Poem Without a Hero. And I want to end this short presentation by bringing our context to yours. When two geniuses meet, the result is often fateful for both of them. Goethe and Schiller, Wagner and Nietzsche, and I don't know why they're always German, but the meeting between the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova and Isaiah Berlin in Leningrad in 1945 has been described as the most extraordinary encounter in the history of 20th century literature. Not much is actually known about the meeting between the 56-year-old poet and the 36-year-old philosopher. The two of them sat down at nine in the evening and they talked for 12 hours straight. Neither ever gave much account of the details of their conversation, except that after he left, she hurriedly wrote a piece, Poem Without a Hero, in which she described him as the guest from the future, the prophet of divided cultures. Akhmatova's description of the artist as both the guest from the future and the prophet of divided cultures are deeply meaningful, especially in South Africa, one of the most divided cultures on the planet. Guests and prophets. The artists, and I mean that in the widest possible sense of the word, whom we invite, consciously or otherwise, to tell us the future. And I suppose that's how I see our current South African students. Architecture is all about the future, and architectural education even more so. The very act of drawing or making is an act of faith. And in schools of architecture, we never or very rarely build a building. We build representations of buildings in the hope that one day, in the not too distant future, those drawings will emerge out of the ground. Architecture is full of romantics who think that even relatively small changes to the built environment create the aspiration for a better society. And in every architect, there is the thought or the hope that the future will be better. That is why we do it, and this is how we do it. Thank you.